Good morning, everyone. Let's stand this morning. Are we ready to worship? Let's praise Him this morning.
be all about you this morning. These praises that we sing, may we behold the Lamb of God that was slain, who takes away the sins of the world, God. May you work in us and through us, God, to do your work. It's not our will, but your will be done, Lord. We lift these praises to you in this place this morning, God. Meet us here now. Comfort us. Renew us day by day, God. As we sing these songs. See him there, the great I am, a crown of thorns upon his head, the Father's heart displayed for us. Oh God, we thank you for. Lifted up, Calvary's hill, we cursed your name, and even still, you bore our shame, and paid the cost, oh God, we thank you for the cross. Come on, behold him.
Good morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. We recognize that you do reign and you are the sovereign king and the creator of the universe and you sustain all things by the power of your hand and you sit on your throne and all is well. And Lord, uh, in scary times and confusing times, you are our firm foundation. The firm foundation is proven uh, to us. Uh, your faithfulness and your love to us is proven by Jesus Christ that he would come and sacrifice himself for us, that we would have newness of life. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we might know you. And Lord, we just give you all the honor and all the glory. And, and Lord, we recognize you to be uh, our Heavenly Father. And, and uh, we need you and we thank you. And Lord, we just ask your blessing upon our families today, every ma marriage, uh, every every husband, every wife, every child here that is represented, Lord, that you would bless them and, and keep them, make your face shine upon them. And for those among us who are suffering, uh, either mentally or physically or emotionally, Lord, that you would uh, make your presence very known uh, this morning, uh, that you would speak to their hearts and uh, we would be uplifted knowing that you are our God and we are yours. And Lord, we just ask this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Why don't you get around, say hello to someone you don't know, and have a time of fellowship. Hello, hello, hello. Well, if you uh, didn't come to the picnic last uh, Sunday, you missed a great time. A uh, good time uh, was had by all. The kids had fun, even the adults had fun. Only one broken window. Um, uh, but uh, it, it, was, it was a good time. And uh, it's, it just practice um, being in community and, and being in family. So it was a, a great time. Uh, check everything out online. Uh, there will be no men's group um, this week. I'll be out of town. And then uh, come to HIT on Saturday mornings, uh, 8 to 10. We had 15 people there yesterday. Uh, and uh, get involved. Um, if you'd like to volunteer, please see me or one of the deacons. And uh, don't forget, Spanish Bible study is uh, going on uh, 9.30 here on Sundays, uh, Spanish Bible study. Now, I do have a slide up there. Um, about our mission trip. Uh, we sent Carlos Duenas and uh, Jaime and Estrit Rodriguez to Guatemala um, to visit Mauro and uh, his church and uh, they had a wonderful time. We're still trying to work out a lot of details but we would like to go uh, help uh, the Prince of Peace Church. I'm not even gonna try it. that's the ow, right? Is that right, Mauro? Check it out. All right. But anyways, um, it's, it's up in the mountains. You can see uh, three uh, volcanoes. 
Um, and uh, what we're trying to do is we, we have a lot of uh, things to work out, transportation, housing, and all that kind of stuff. So if you're interested um, and would be interested in going on a mission trip either this summer or the fall, um, maybe uh, November time, um, because there's rainy seasons and everything like that, so we've got to work around that as well. Please talk to Jaime. He'll be in the back with a sign-up list and just to keep us uh, moving forward in that, okay? Um, I will call down the uh, ushers and we'll take our morning offering uh, for today. Again, this is a, a time that we worship by giving back to God what he has given to us with grateful hearts, with cheerful hearts. Um, we now uh, thank him for his, his faithfulness. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. You are the giver of all good gifts. And you have been faithful to us again, and you have given to us in abundance. And Lord, uh, if we tried to count the blessings, uh, not only material, but physical and, and emotional and spiritual blessings, Lord, you have not kept back your own, your own son. Um, you have given us all things. And Lord, we just thank you for that. And now, Lord, we just uh, ask you to use these gifts and tithes and offerings, Lord, that we could be the people of God you've called us to be, that we might um, be salt and light in Guatemala, in Colombia, in uh, Venezuela, and here in the United States, Lord, that we might proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as they're uh, taking the, our morning offering, I'm going to ask uh, Lisa and, and Matt to come up. And Luke. <laughs> right, Luke? Uh, so this is a pleasure. Um, we're going to baptize Luke today. But before we do so, uh, I've known probably more than 10 years, right? Um, I've known Matt and, and Lisa for over 10 years. Um, they've been with us now a couple of years. And uh, they just had a baby. Four months? Four months. Um, and, uh, and it's time to baptize them, but before we're going to baptize them, they're going to become members of the church. And this is really important because um, when, we, when we talk about covenant and when, when we talk about family, and um, one of the reasons why they're bringing Luke here uh, before you today is that this is where their local church is, and this is where they practice their gifts, and this is where they belong, and, and we take part in their lives as they take part in in ours. And so I have uh, five questions for them um, to become members. And so, do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the light of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope, uh, save his sovereign mercy? Yes. yes. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God, Savior of sinners? Do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he's offered in the gospel? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ? Yes. Do you promise to support the church in its work and uh, worship to the best of your ability? Yes. Do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? Yes. Okay. Now, now they're members. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> So now we're going to, to baptize Luke, and, and this is a seal of the covenant of our ingrafting into Christ, our union with him. This word baptism is so complex that, that it means so much, but for Luke, what it means is that when we uh, uh, baptize him, the, the, the water represents uh, the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit now in his life. Uh, the promise is made to believers and their children. Uh, there is uh, an understanding that because uh, Matthew and Lisa are believers, that this is a child of the covenant, and the promises are made to them and their generations. Uh, reading in Acts chapter 2, verses uh, 39, Genesis 17, 7, and Acts 16, 31, it says, for to you is the promise, and to your children, and to all that are far off, 
even as many as the Lord our God shall call to him. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and your seed after you without their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your seed after you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your household. Now, uh, what, we're, what we're doing here is we're including Luke into this body, right? And, and that means we're going to treat him as a child of the covenant. And that comes with great blessing, but also great responsibilities. So we're going to treat him as if he was a communing member. Um, but we're not going to wait until he's a teenager and decides. We're going to say, no, he's a part of us now. And, and we, we're not basing it on man's decision, but we're basing it on the, the promise of, of God. Now, when he comes to age, he will become a member of the church and take uh, vows just like his, his mother and, and, and father have. And uh, this is what we're going to do today. Okay? Okay? All right. He looks excited. So serious. So these are the questions uh, for you as parents. Do you acknowledge your child's need for the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Do you claim God's covenant promises in his behalf, and do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation as you do your own? Yes. Do you now unreservedly dedicate your child to God and promise in humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before him a godly example? that you will pray with and for him, that you will teach him the doctrines of our holy religion, and that you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Yes. Now this goes to the congregation because they're not alone. Do you as a congregation undertake the responsibility of assisting the parents in the Christian nurture of this child? All in favor? Okay. have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for what you're doing in this family's life. We thank you for Matt and Lisa, and we thank you for the life you have given to Luke Matthew. And Lord, we just ask your blessing upon them, and Lord, that uh, their house may be full of joy and love and passion for you. And Lord, we just ask your blessing uh, as they leave here today, that they would feel part of a family, part of a covenant, and that your promises cover them and you will never leave or forsake them. And Lord, we just thank you for this. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Thank you. God bless you. Yeah, God bless you. God bless you. Bless you. Again, good morning. We're going to continue our, our sermon series in Luke. We're in Luke chapter 6, 
and we are going to uh, jump around a little bit um, and talk about some radical demands of following Jesus. So let's have a word of prayer. We'll get started. Heavenly Father, we just ask your blessing upon this time, Lord, that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit, that you would convict us and move in us, um, that we would uh, see who you truly are and what you have called us to do and be and uh, live that. And Lord, we just ask this all in the, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So uh, last week we, we talked about the Sabbath. Um, this week, uh, Jesus goes up onto the top of a mountain and he prays to God and then he chooses his 12 disciples. And as he's coming down the, the, the mount, there's a level area. It's still kind of Sermon on the Mount, but it's a level area on the mount. And he uh, starts to talk to them of what it looks like to follow Jesus. Now, I, I saw a, a documentary, um, it said Beware of Christians, that was the, the documentary name, um, but it was Beware of Superficial Christians was the, the kind of gist of it, and, and the, the, the question is, do we have a superficial Christianity? There, there's a lot of followers who have never really followed Jesus. Uh, in men's group, we were, were going through uh, revelations and we were looking at the letter to the Ephesians and the letter to the Ephesians showed that uh, they were very faithful to doctrine and they were very faithful to the truth and they were very faithful to, to everything that church life was supposed to be. But, he, but Jesus says against this church, but this is what I have against you. You've forgotten your first love. They've abandoned their love. Now, I do a lot of weddings. Um, you ever gone to a wedding and they go to 1 Corinthians 13 to talk about love? Always out of context, by the way. Um, that's not what it's talking about. But uh, it's a great portion. So if you would go to the 1 Corinthians 13, we're only going to read the first three verses. But I, I, I want to define us. There was a, a, so, a song that came out in the 1960s, kind of a hippie movement. Um, but it was, they will know we are Christians by our love. They will know we are Christians by our love. It didn't say by our rightness or our, our study, our studios intellect. It didn't tell us uh, how long we stand up and praise. It says that we will know you by your love. And I think it's biblical because if you read 13, 1 through 3, it says, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. So it seems to me that love is pretty important, right? Because remember, there's going to be a time that people go before the Lord, and this is in Matthew 7, and it says, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these wonderful things in, in, in your name? And he says, apart from me, because I never knew you. I never loved you. I never knew you. We, we know we are Christians by our love. Matthew 24, verses 11 and 12. Here, Jesus is talking about the end times. And uh, he says... In the end times, there's going to be so much confusion and there's rumors of war and, 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 and earthquakes and all this other kind of stuff going on. And then he says in verse 24, uh, 11 and 12, it says, And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The love of many will grow cold. So the, the real question is, how's your love? You know, and, and this is, I didn't say how many times you're going to church. I didn't say how much are you reading the Bible. I didn't, because none of that matters unless it is dipped, dunked, moved around and squashed around and covered in what? Love. 
Now, I think this love that he's talking about, it's an agape love, of course. It requires a complete overhaul of one's life. You can't just, like, sprinkle a little bit of love into your life, right? Um, and, and I think this is when I, I... If you look at some Christians in the developing world, you don't say third world anymore, but in the developing world, they would look at our Christianity and laugh at it. Because in some developing countries, it has a cost to be a Christian. There's persecution. There's more Christians being persecuted today than, than any other time, right? And, and so we, we need to look at this, and, and, and this love is different than regular church life. And I love that you came today. I love that you ate a croquetta. And I love that you, you participated in all this. But that is much different than being a follower of Jesus Christ. We really have to have a life that emulates, that imitates God's dealing with the word, world. Now, this word agape love is really doing good. Sacrificially, but doing good. And we're going to see that it's a command to love one another and to love enemies. It's a command. Therefore, it has little to do with feeling or emotion. Do you hear what I just said? Because the world has said if you don't feel in love, then you can throw it away. It's not about feeling, it's about obedience. We, we, sang, we, we sang that song, you know, I'm going to take Jesus at his word. And he said this and he said this. Well, he said, love your enemies. Now, when I, I teach this, because in, in Romans chapter 12, it talks about uh, uh, loving your enemies. And this is the hardest thing for Gen Z or whatever they are in high school now. Um, because if you do something bad to me, they'll say, oh, you're dead to me. There's no coming back from that. There's little forgiveness, little mercy, and little love. But that worries me because we're raising a, a generation that has to submit to this if we would consider to be followers of Jesus Christ. Now, the, I, I, I chose, this is not a new uh, thing to love uh, one another and to love enemies. If you look at Exodus 24, 23, I'm sorry, 23, chapter 4, there's another command here. 23. It says, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. It's a commandment. If you meet someone and their enemy lost something, then you should help your enemy. Look at Proverbs 25. Proverbs chapter 25. Verse 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. So this is, this is not a new thing. And this is the heart of what Jesus is trying to, to teach here in this sermon. So I want to read Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 36. Luke chapter 6, 27 through 36. It says, love your enemies. Now, it's going to describe that, you know, if you love those who love you, there's, no, there's nothing really great in that because that's what the sinners do. We shouldn't say, oh, Jesus, you should congratulate me because I act like every other sinner. No, he, he raises the bar in how we're supposed to love. Look what it says in verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that, uh, and as you wish that others would do to you, do to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. 
And if you lend to those whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good, and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Wow. All right? That's a lot. The command to love our enemies is actively seeking to do them good, to pray for them. Generosity. When, when they, they, it turns in an evil thing that they do, you give them more and it turns into charity. You give them grace. You give them mercy. And this is for all our enemies. And sometimes our enemies are personal, just really difficult people to love in your, in your family, right? I don't know if you have difficult people to love in your family, and if you don't know, you're probably that difficult one. Um, yeah. Um, it, it might be religious, it might be political, but, but today, more than ever, we're so divided and so angry, and social media just feeds it, but if we don't love, what we've found out through history is the opposite happens. Love, I mean, if we don't love, chaos it happens and, and hate and treating your enemy poorly just perpetuates hostility. There's a spiral of violence and it's always escalating. Now, this was really important because the, the Jewish people in the Old Testament really lost their way. They were supposed to be blessings to all nations. They were supposed to be the people of God, representing God to all nations. Look what it says in Esther. Now, Esther is a, a book in the, it's like a narrative book in the Old Testament. But if we look at Esther uh, chapter 9, verse 5. It says, this is part of the narrative, the Jews destroy their enemies. The Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. Oof. Doesn't sound good, right? But one, when we take our eyes off of what God has called us to be and to do, we start emulating and imitating the world. And the world is the strongest of the fittest. You've got, if someone hits you, you've got to respond twice as hard. If someone's, and, and this happens in, in, in high school, it happens, if someone says something bad to you, you've got to get them back twice. And it's always escalating. And we're copying the ways of the world. And then the question is, um, what drives this and its self-interest, my self-protection? Because if you read what Jesus said, um, you think he's being sarcastic. I mean, that, that's kind of crazy, right? I mean, enemies only respect strength. And you, you, maybe he's kidding. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe, maybe he's just joking. Um, maybe he didn't mean it. That's not what we're supposed to do, Matt. Come on, that's too radical. You want me to be abused? You, you want me to turn the other cheek? You want me to forgive? You want me to love my enemy? You want me to be slandered? Oh, that's too impossible. That's too foolish. Or maybe we call ourselves followers but have never followed Jesus. That's a tough one. See, everything, if we're, we're all against our self-interest and, and it's all about power, there's a, a quote from a, a philosopher, Greek philosopher, he said, even those who do not want to kill anyone, they want to have the power to do so. And we can rationalize this, well, this is how the world works now, and you've got to work, work within the world, but we're no longer of this world. We're, we're completely radicalized. It's, it, it, nothing is too impossible for God. And to the world, it will consider be foolish, but the gospel is the power of God for those who believe. 
verse 16, getting back to our, 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 our text, chapter, Luke chapter 6, uh, verse 17, he states, it's really interesting, um, he states, um, and he came down with them and stood on a level place with his great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. Why is that important? Well, Josephus, the historian of the Jews, say that the people from Tyre and Sidon were the ungodliest people that they were, and we were bitterest enemies with them. So they're present, and he's telling his new disciples, look, Sidon, your enemies are here. The ones you have bitterness to are here, and I'm calling you to a higher love. And they were also being persecuted by Rome, um, and it sets the tone with how we're supposed to live in this crazy, sinful world. Sin-filled world. So how does one respond to abuse, hatred, betrayal, infidelity, maltreatment, being lied to and about, being assaulted, insulted, or cheated? Throw two stones? Do we get them back? Hatfields and McCoys. The 20, 21st century is a culture of violence. You've got to attack and defend yourself because you can't be a what? A victim. Well, I think this is, I, I don't think we need to attack and defend and I don't think we need to be victims. Listen to me here. Followers of Jesus Christ are never victims. Did you hear that? Followers of Jesus Christ are never victims, but we are aggressive in our loving response. We're aggressive with our love. What does that mean? Well, it means that our goal is not to keep our enemy our enemy. Our goal is for restoration, reconciliation, peace, and this outward shalom. Now, it's risky, right? Sacrificial love comes with risk, ask Jesus. Right? Because there's a verse that says, even when we were enemies, Christ, what? Died for us. And he didn't, he, he, when, when we did everything and, and, and he was lied about and he was cheated on and he was uh, hated and abused and maltreated and, 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 and slandered and everything like that, how did God love? He didn't respond back. He remained silent. He actually said, forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're even doing. See, through the gospel, we learn that God does not want us to maintain ourselves to be enemies or alienated from God, but he wants to make a transformational change. Now, this is, this is really important. Remember the, the story about the, the lady who came in and started crying at Jesus' feet and, and washed his, his feet with her hair and her tears? And, and the Pharisees said, oh, if he knew who was touching her because she was of ill rapport, right? Oh, if she, and, and Jesus said, listen, those who are what? Forgiven much, love and I think this is really important is because if our love is growing cold, it's because we've forgotten our first love and we've forgotten the gospel and we've forgotten that we didn't deserve anything we had. Sinners by, natural, by our nature, enemies of God, not submissive to him, always choosing our own way until he showed grace. And sent his son Jesus to who would die on the cross for us and on the third day resurrect, therefore that we might have peace with God, stand in grace, rejoice in our hope that what he says is true. And that, that makes us understandably grateful. But if we don't understand how much God has forgiven you, you will never love anybody. What you'll do is you'll sit in judgment of them. And you'll judge them by your own standard. And you'll say, hmm, I'm better, or they should be like me, or this is that, that's a weakness, that's a this. Listen, until you realize that you don't deserve it, 
and everything is grace, can you love another? Evil can only be defeated by love. If you have an evil problem in your love, let's put some Jesus love on it. Look, Romans 12, 21. Romans chapter 12, verse 21. says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You ever heard that saying, two wrongs don't make a right? Usually in our fights, someone will do something wrong, and then someone will do another thing wrong. And then another person will do another wrong, and we just keep on going back and forth and doing something wrong. And, and it, it doesn't work that way. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We're more than overcomers in the love of Jesus Christ. We do not have to fight like the world fights. We can. Because the battle's been won for us. We've received so much. So, we, so the application, the practical side of this and Jesus gives it, it's not mine. It says, a person should respond not on the basis of how one is treated, but on the basis of how one wants to be treated. You want respect? Then do what? Respect. You want to be loved? Then love. If you don't want to be lied to, don't lie. If you want an honest relationship, be honest. And treat others with honesty. And listen, I'm not naive enough to think that, oh, this is pie in the sky, everything's going to happen. Maybe nothing happens. Maybe you forgive and you love someone, and they still miserable old bags. And they hate life. Maybe that's it. Maybe nothing happens, but I'm going to tell you that hate is a poison that only you consume. And this is about us following Jesus Christ. It comes with risk, but to love actually frees us. So, three things. First of all, um, I don't want a business tit-for-tat type of thing. You do this and I'll do this. It's like a business transaction. That's what the, that's what the uh, sinners do, right? Um, not to love so you'll be treated well. I'll do this for him but he's got to do this for me. I'll do this for the church, but they've got to do it for me. That's not how Jesus works. Jesus says, no, I'm going to do this to make enemies reconciled. I'm going to sacrifice myself so my enemies don't stay my enemies. That's what Christians do. We have to act in the light of our future hope and our relationships. Listen, now that we have peace with God and we have the union with the Son through the power of the Holy Spirit, it's not necessarily me imitating God. It is God imitating himself through me. It's not me trying, oh, Lord, give me your love. No. Lord, work your love for this person out through me. Completely different. Love this person through me. Pour out your grace on this person through me. Because if left by yourself, can you love these people? No. Now, the ultimate basis for our behavior is God's way. He says, be merciful as, if, as God is what? Merciful. Listen, at the end times, it says there, our love is growing cold. This is where I think we're really lacking. We don't show mercy for anybody. Make a mistake, you're dead. Do this, you're dead. We don't forgive. And, and, and I, I do a lot of marriage counseling, and the, most, most marriages do well with big things. They do horrible with little things. 
and they never resolve anything. And so you have the death of a thousand cuts, right? And the death of a thousand cut is that it's cut and cut and cut and cut and cut and little offenses that never get forgiven or little offenses that never get loved or, or, or nothing happens. There's no repentance. And by the end, five, six, seven years, they say, I'm empty. I'm blood out. I'm blood out. I got nothing left. Why? It's because we won't show mercy but why won't we show mercy? It's because we haven't understood really how much mercy we've received. We don't forgive because we don't realize how much forgiveness we've received. And we don't love because we haven't realized the love of Jesus Christ in the quantity, the amazing quantity that he has loved us. And until you're convicted by the Holy Spirit that you have received mercy, received love, and received grace, will you give it? then we can say this is the way of God's people follow. Like I said, the story says they will know we are Christians by our love. Jesus said in John 13, he said, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And I just want to close going back to Revelation chapter 2, verse uh, 1 through 7, when Ephesian, uh, they're talking to the, the church in Ephesus, and he says, this is what I have against you. You've been super faithful. You're super right. You're super good, but you've lost your love. And then he says, it's time to repent. And if anything's touched you today about loving neighbor, and you might have someone that's come into the mind by the power of the Holy Spirit that you need to forgive, that you need to love, that's very difficult to love. It might be your pastor. I don't know. Um... But, but if there is, and you haven't loved as Christ has loved, it's time to repent. If you have not shown mercy to people as you've received mercy, it's time to repent. If you have not shown grace to people as you have seen grace, when God gave you everything, when you deserve nothing, it's time to repent. So let's do one more thing. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 again. Marriage time. This is even worse, right? This is the next part that everyone loves. Chapter 13. Four through seven. And you've all heard it before, but I want to change it a little bit. And when we read it, um, put that person in there. It says, love is patient and kind. Put, my love, is my love patient and kind for this person? Does my love not envy and boast for this person? Is my love not arrogant for this person or rude? Does it not insist in its own ways? It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoings, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And this is the crazy part about it. If we use this for our love, I'm going to tell you right now, your love is not enough. The only one who has loved like this is Jesus Christ. Now we have access to that love through the, through the Holy Spirit. Now the prayer is, Lord, you do this. Your love work through me because I'm so grateful. You've shown me so much mercy. You've shown me so much grace. You've shown me so much love. Let me love other people. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. God, you have told us in your, your scriptures that you are love. And there is no love outside of you, Lord, that we would see you as our loving Father, that you have proven your love for us by sending your Son on the cross, and, and you have sent the Counselor and the Comforter um, so we'd never be alone because you love us even today. Lord, we repent because we might be superficial in our following of you. That we follow you on Sundays, but we don't forgive. And we don't show mercy, and we don't love the difficult ones. And we sit in judgment, and we imitate the world and not live in your kingdom. We repent, Lord. But Lord, we don't stay in repentance because you have forgiven us 
And Lord, now we strive by the power of the Holy Spirit that your love would invade our homes, that they, your love would invade our relationships and invade the difficult relationships that we have, whether it be personal, liberal, political, religious. Lord, there's so much division. We can't change the world, Lord, but that when it comes to us, Lord, that they would know that we are Christians by our love. Amen. As always, we practice a Holy Communion table, um, and it is an outward symbol of an inward reality of God's love for us and now God's love in us. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, um, anyone uh, who takes this, uh, examine yourselves. Um, and if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and have put your hope in him and him alone uh, and belong to a member of a church and, and you have put your faith in Jesus, we practice an open communion table. But if you have not, this is, there's nothing special in the juice or the bread or the person who serves it. This is received by faith, and when we receive it by faith, it is a way that we grow in grace. We grow in the understanding of God's love for us and how we're supposed to love others. So if you would like to join us, please come down the center aisle and return to your seats in the side aisle. Refrain from eating until we can all partake together. Oh.
On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was with his disciples and he broke bread and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread together. That same night, as the dinner was closed and he was with his disciples and he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the covenant for forgiveness of sin. Take this in remembrance of him. Now receive the benediction. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, make us lovers of souls. Amen.